All right, welcome everyone to today's event, Using Tech to Upgrade Our Criminal Justice System. My name is Ian Adams, and I'm a senior fellow with the R Street Institute. Uh, today's event is brought to you by R Street and Right on Crime, which is a pro project of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, who uh, they were generous enough to let us come to their home and how amazing it is. First time I've seen it, and it's unreal. Uh, additionally, we would like to thank our partners, the Charles Koch Institute and the Coalition for Public Safety, without whose support we would not be able to have this event today. So um, today we are bringing together for you a bipartisan cast of experts and entrepreneurs and legislators to explore the ways in which emerging technology and new innovations can upgrade our broken system. And I'm, I'm very excited for the conversations to come because these panelists believe that we cannot wait to solve the big policy questions related to sentencing guidelines, uh, police community relations, and post-prison reentry, and that the tech sector, uh, the tech sector, including many here at South by Southwest, has an incredible opportunity to lead the way in developing solutions that will improve public safety, save taxpayers money, and enable redemption for those who are struggling. So without further ado, I would like for uh, our first panel to join me on the stage. If you'd just come on up. And I will do some brief introductions. This panel is entitled The New Wave of Justice Innovators. And this discussion is going to explore how apps, emerging technologies, um, how they're tackling criminal justice issues uh, from first contact with the police through the last day of incarceration. So our moderator is uh, Jasmine Heiss, who's the Director of Coalitions and Outreach at the Coalition for Public Safety. It's a bipartisan group of advocates committed to addressing problems with our nation's criminal justice system. We have John Tippins, who is the co-creator of expunge.us and expungemaryland.org, two sites devoted to helping those with criminal pasts clear their record, find jobs, housing, and uh, have access to services. We have Jordan Richardson. Uh, Jordan is a senior policy analyst at the Charles Koch Institute, where he conducts research on the criminal justice system. And I should say, um, Jordan has coordinated a panel that's happening a little later on that will include Snoop Dogg, as I understand it. Very good. So that will be March 18th at 2 p.m. in the convention center. Um, check it out. So then we have Lauren Krasai. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Perfect. All right, I was worrying all day. Uh, is the director of criminal justice reform at the Reason Foundation, where she works on a variety of criminal justice issues, including sentencing reform, prison reform, and drug policy, particularly at the state level. We have Rick Lane. Rick is a strategic advisor to Vary, a new law enforcement monitoring app where he focuses on the public policy implications of new and emerging technologies in the criminal justice space. And then we have um, Derek Cohen. Uh, I should say Dr. Dr. Cohen. Congratulations, recently uh, finishing a PhD at the University of Cincinnati. That's fantastic. Derek is the Deputy Director of Right on Crime and the Center for Effective Justice here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. So with that, Jasmine. Take it away. Thank you. Yes. Morning, folks. How are you all? Morning. All right. Thank you. And good morning to all of us on the live stream. Um, all, all of you, thank you for joining us remotely here at South by Southwest. Um, I'm very excited to be talking to this group of panelists this morning. A lot of very, very smart people sitting next to me and a lot of very smart folks in the room. So just on behalf of the Coalition for Public Safety, thank you for joining us and thank you everyone for bringing your expertise and your perspective. Um, I know a lot of people that I'm looking out at today are very deep in this work, have a background in it, but sort of for the benefit of setting the stage and for those of us who are joining us remotely or those of you, um, let's zoom out for a moment. So before we dive into the nuances of using tech to fix this broken system, how did we get here and what's broken for my panelists? Well, I, I, I'll go first. Um, Great. You know, I'd actually, I'd actually reject that premise. I don't think the criminal justice system is, is, so, is so much broken per se as it is miscalibrated. 
Uh, one of the bigger issues uh, that we have in criminal justice is not that, I, I, I would say that the system doesn't function as intended. I, th I think that actually that it does in a bit too well. The problem is the, the incentives and the, uh, the systemic factors that we have ingrained into the system is, is you know, tends to uh, lead to what, the, you know, the results that come up and that most people say uh, is indicative of the system being broken. So I got, you know, I was working uh, directly on issues both of incarceration and, and policing uh, during my PhD program. And you just see so many room, uh, so many opportunities for improvement, so much room for, uh, room for growth, room for uh, reform. Uh, that for whatever reason not, oftentimes statutorily mandated, that tends to, you know, be left on the table. And that's when I came here about three years ago and been working here ever since. Thanks so much. Yep. I think part of it is that it's not a s sexy issue, you know, policy issue. Um, I was so pleased to hear back in January where the speaker Ryan said that criminal justice reform is one of his top priorities. Um, it's one of those issues in Washington with all the fighting that's going on where you do have the left and the right wanting to work together. It's the Venn diagram of public policy, the perfect storm, maybe for different reasons, mm -hmm. but they all share the same goal of trying to fix it. And for me, kind of new into this area of criminal justice reform, I see that with a lot, I feel there's a lot of hope in that regard, especially with everything else that's going on in Washington, that this is one area where everyone can kind of start looking at it and not have it hidden as an issue that people in the past did not want to talk about. And I think that will be helpful going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Lauren, you spend a lot of your time doing just that and, and talking about it. Um, do you want to weigh in on what you see as the urgent problems to fix? This one is, okay, there we go. Um, yeah, I think, you know, if we're, if we're talking about tech and how to fix uh, our criminal justice system, specifically for this panel, I mean, I think uh, in doing research, I think at, at the state level, when we're trying to examine what are some things that are broken and what, what can we fix, I mean, some of it is intuitive. I think we're sending, you know, too many low-level <coughs> offenders to prison for too long. Um, but on the other hand, I think that if we want to have a holistic, uh, you know, look at the criminal justice system, I think that you know, there's, there's just a lot of information that we don't know. There's a lot of data that we just simply don't keep track of. Um, and so it's hard to truly know how our system is working, um, who's going to prison for what reasons. Um, I'll just, I have some things written down, just some basic things that we don't know, just to, just to kind of clarify what I'm talking about here. Um, there's some basic information, like how many people in the US have criminal records? We don't know, <laughs> actually, this, this is just not, kept track of. We have estimates. We think that there's around 70 million people that have criminal records, but that we don't have a, an exact number. Um, how many people have been to prison at least once? Um, we know how many people are admitted to prison every year, um, but since we don't have any data on how many unique individuals or people who are going to prison for the first time, um, we, we, we don't know. Um, and how many people are in jail because they can't afford to post bail? Um, you know, are they housed there because they're dangerous? Are they housed, or why are they in jail? Um, some states, they just don't keep track of this information. Um, and if they do, it's just totally incomplete and we're, we're not really able to analyze it. Um, civil asset forfeiture, um, an issue that I know is a, kind of a hot button issue here in Texas. Um, you know, some states, they don't keep track of when people have their assets seized, uh, when they're forfeited. There's just simply no data on this stuff. So, and I have other examples as well. Um, but I think that, you know, if we're, if we're talking about how we can make our criminal justice system more efficient and more effective, we need to start keeping track of some of this information um, in order to better understand what problems we really need to address. Um, so that's my short little spiel. I can talk about that later. I was going to say, John, I, I see you nodding your head a lot. And this idea of who has a criminal record, what do you do about it, is very close to your work. Sure. Um, I think trying to diagnose all the problems that we could fix or all of the things that we could change in the criminal justice system would take the amount of time required to finish a PhD, right? Uh, we could talk about uh, sentencing reform. We could talk about juvenile justice. We could talk about mandatory uh, minimums, law enforcement. Um, I do think it'd be useful to, to hone in on one concrete example to get a sense for 
uh, a specific problem, how you might go about fixing it, the challenges we face today. So mm -hmm. we've talked a little bit about record clearing. One of the problems that we have is data. Like we don't, we don't have a precise number. We don't retain information about how many people have a criminal record. Um, in my case, I focus on expungement, which is the clearing of, of records, if you haven't heard about that legal process before. But um, sure, uh, it's estimated about 70 million or 78 million, one in four Americans have a criminal record that could be an arrest. It could be um, you know, actually getting booked. Um, but um, you can imagine with numbers like that, with an, with an enormous, a st a stark number of people potentially with a criminal record, um, the resources that we have to fix that problem, to clear the record, to, to bring them to expungement, to um, process that number of people, we're, we're vastly outmatched, right? There's pro bono organizations that work on this across the state, um, across the states, but uh, we don't have the money, we don't have the, the people, the human uh, resources to actually meet that need. Um, and I think that this is one place that technology can help us, right? So rather than have a dedicated human being to clear, you know, let's say 15 expungements in a given uh, day, to process 15 uh, expungements in a given day, we have online platforms where we can store information, where we can say, hey, um, you know, here's 200 people that need an expungement in the state of Mississippi, right? Um, let's spread this out over time. Let's spread the work out. Let's make it so that this is manageable. Um, so I, I do think there's an enormous opportunity for, for tech to step in, um, in problems in criminal justice uh, that otherwise would, we'd be outmatched or outpaced. Yeah, absolutely. Jordan, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, so I think when we talk about uh, technology and criminal justice, it, it reminded me of the Isaac Asimov quote is that, you know, the, the sadness about life is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Um, we have a ton of tools available to us to be able to help solve our problems, but the question we have is a lot has to do with implementation. Um, a lot of the research that I've done is on the issue of body-worn cameras for police officers. Um, you know, they can be used as a good tool. They were used in Rialto, California, where they found an 88% decrease in, the, in citizen complaints after they were implemented, and a 59% decrease in officer-involved shootings. But other studies have shown that actually body cameras can, there's a study out of Temple University this past year that found there's a 3% increase overall in the number of shootings by police when they have a body-worn camera because they feel the video evidence will back them up and they're more likely to use uh, lethal force. <coughs> so the question is, you know, how do we use this technology? And it really comes down to the basic question of, it, it's not the tool that we're trying to address, it's the underlying problem. And you know, I think there's a, a problem with our institutions. People have a lack of trust in institutions and that's a problem that's getting worse. Um, so what I would like to see is the use of technology as a tool to be able to increase trust, to have transparency and accountability. Um, you know, it's like you can have a, a, an amazing car that has, you know, an amazing specifications, it's fast, you've got a Corvette, but if the driver doesn't know what he's doing inside that car, it's a worthless tool. So what we need to do is to be working on fixing those problems of the institutions themselves and how they implement tools as well. So one of the things that I, I particularly appreciate about this panel um, and just hearing all of you answer that question is sort of the way in which your approaches to the criminal justice system sort of illuminate the full spectrum of ways that you can look at it all the way from, you know, how are people interacting with the police to what happens when someone leaves prison and has a criminal record. Um, so to, to sort of get a better sense of, of that full spectrum and then who you are and why you come to this work, um, again, for the full panel, what what was the, the problem statement or what was the thing that confronted you that made you say, wow, we really need to consider how to employ better technologies, how to employ new ideas to fix the system? Sure, I'm happy to start. Um, I was at 21st Century Fox for the past 15 years and why am I involved now in criminal justice reform? Because my focus is going forward is the future of work. And we are in a situation now with automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, um, taking away um, jobs from people. You think about um, autonomous vehicles and what the impact that it's going to have on truck drivers and others. And it's not to say we should stop technology, but it's going to have a huge impact. If you combine that with criminal justice reform, the goal of criminal justice reform is to get people out of prison and jail and into society working. But if the jobs are starting to decline, the people who aren't in jail and all of a sudden you have an influx of people with criminal records taking those jobs, you could have a type of tension that is created where people think it's unfair that they're being put ahead. So my focus began really looking at 
how do we structure our economy going forward in this in a time when it's rapid innovation to ensure that we have jobs for what I call the unemployable class, people who want to work but don't have the skill set going forward, and not everyone's going to be a coder. On top of that, um, there was a company that was brought to me called Vary, which is why I'm here, that had a technological solution to deal with the facilitation of monitoring folks who are on probation to help get them the services that they needed to help try to increase the chances that they would not go to back to prison. Because right now, for example, in Rhode Island, 60% of the people on probation are not being monitored, not being helped. And those people are getting lost in the system and they can tend to be homeless and, and moving forward. You know, we need to make sure that everyone is being helped and trying to get them back into society so that they're not caught, you know, in a total vicious cycle. Anyone else want to share the problem statement that brought them to this, this moment and this work? I think, with the, I think the biggest uh, problem statement one can say about uh, criminal justice writ large is that it's, it's a system of finite resources and there's not a consensus on how those resources should be spent. Um, if, if you look at, you know, I, I could leave here today and, you know, before dinner time, I actually have a criminal justice system um, with very low recidivism, massive, outcome, massive outcomes in public safety. The problem is that will bankrupt the state. Um, it, it's something that is not, a t you know, there's always going to be trade-offs, there's always going to be deadweight loss, there's always going to be uh, sunk costs, there's always going to be all these different things that say, you know, money spent in the criminal justice system gets to a point of diminishing returns, as we've actually seen with our kind of over-reliance of incarceration for the last three decades, I'd say. So start, starting uh, a foray into technology in criminal justice, uh, looking at our risk needs assessments that are developing. Looking at our, you know, something down is down to electronic monitoring or something basic like that. All these things are ways in which technology stretches the the outcomes of those resources. Whether it's, um, you know, ensuring someone's at least monitored, if not, uh, not recidivating. I guess would be the easiest way to say. Um, but just to ensure that somebody uh, that is in, interacted with the criminal justice system, how do we get the most bang for the buck? And I think that that's where you know the problem statement that at least you know, brought me here most, most acutely. Yeah, for me it was essentially two things. Uh, when I was still in law school, I was helping out um, at various legal clinics, you know, helping clear records. And it was a very simple problem. We had more people than we could help, right? The need outmatched our ability to meet it. Um, so that was, on the one hand, that was the first thing, is just seeing that need and, and trying to figure out how to better meet that need. Mm. Um, and then the second thing was, I was working at the Maryland Attorney General's office and quite frequently heard the click clack of actual typewriters still being used. So the legal sector in many places, not all, I, I mean, I want to give credit where credit's due, it's the legal sector is moving forward with technology in very interesting ways, but um, throughout across the states, you'll see that um, legal processes are slow to catch up where industry has already um, outpaced them. And I wanted to be a part of trying to update how we do and you know, basic legal services and expungement is one of them. So that was basically what brought me here. Um, yeah, so, I think just kind of circling back to the point that I was uh, originally making is just our lack of information uh, in the criminal justice system. I think when I first got started on doing research um, on, on different things, reason is sort of, well, we're a libertarian think tank and we kind of have a libertarian management structure. When I was brought on, it was just sort of like, okay, well, you know, get started on whatever you want. Just <laughs> dive in and see what you can find and see, you know, what are some opportunities for you to do some research and how can you you know, improve um, different correction systems at the state level. And as I started diving in, you know, I'd pick a state and I'd try to understand um, the laws, the most problematic ones. And I would try to find information of how many people are incarcerated under these laws and who are these individuals and, and things like that. And as I got started, you know, you find, if you can find information, um, there's not a whole lot of it. And different states, they have different um, sort of ways you can look up inmate information or statistics if they keep track of it at all. And I just realized how there's, there's so little information on a system that, you know, millions of people are affected by. Millions of people are incarcerated for various reasons and we don't, we simply don't keep track of it. Um, and so I think 
that was sort of the real problem issue for me, and it still is. You know, when we write policy briefs and we write policy reports, a lot of times we're filling in the blanks. Um, you know, if we want to criticize civil asset forfeiture, um, I wrote a brief and it hasn't come out yet, but in Mississippi, um, I kind of had to just talk about what issues, uh, or like what are some issues with civil asset forfeiture beyond like how much are they actually taking from people, because at the local level they don't keep track of that. Um, you know, and in Florida, I put out, or we're putting out a brief this week on individuals who are incarcerated for trafficking prescription painkillers. Um, to get information on who these people are, I had to get, I had to put in a request with the DOC. They gave me a list of all the names of the people who are inc currently incarcerated for these offenses. But if I wanted to learn anything else about them, I had to look them up individually on the DOC website. And that was like 2,310 people that I individually <laughs> looked up to see what is their incarceration history? Have they been to prison before? How old are they? Are they elderly? Um, are they incarcerated for any violent offenses? And that was the only way that I was able to get that information. And when we put this policy brief out, it'll be, and this is such a small thing, and I know it's very about me, so I apologize, but just an <laughs> example to help illustrate the problem. Um, when we put this out, legislators are gonna see that and they're like, they're gonna be like, uh, I had no idea that 80% of people incarcerated for these offenses have never been to prison before. Uh, or have only been to prison for like a nonviolent offense. I had no idea that we incarcerate almost 500 elderly people for these offenses. And these are, this is just basic information that I think if legislators were actually equipped with, they would make better policy decisions. And the fact that they don't have this information a lot of the times and they're legislating anyway is part of the reason why we, are, we have this problem now of too many people in prison for these offenses. So that's sort of my background and where I come from on this issue. You know, for me, when I was in law school, I was planning on doing tax law, and so fortunately, I avoided that sad <laughs> life. Uh, but I never really thought about uh, never thought about the criminal justice system at all um, until I started. I worked for a prosecutor during my summers, and you know, I was like, this this makes this really cool, a really <coughs> fascinating thing, and I still wasn't really bought on it. And then, um, you know, later down the road, towards a, a graduation. Um, I had a presentation from someone from Washington, D.C. who talked about the problem of over-criminalization and about how many laws we have in the books and how many ways it's so easy for people to get wrapped up in the system. I think people you wouldn't even think that should be part of, um, part of that. And so, I'd, you know, I was looking into that and I was researching it and then it was struck me that, you know, I was learning a lot in law school about how to put someone behind bars. I was learning about the procedure I needed to do to make sure there's a conviction and I needed to know here's the evidence you have to have lined up and but that's where it stopped that's where the education for a lot of people stops is what happens once we put someone behind bars that we stop thinking about it because the problem solved the crimes been committed we lock them up and we're done but that's not really the full story because it's it's a never-ending cycle if someone comes out of prison and they go back in and then I started looking into the issue of people what happens before they were even charged to begin with. And you looked at police and community relations and about the overcharging and the over um, interaction a lot of communities have with their police officers and the trust that is broken down in so many of these communities. Um, you know, when I talk about the, 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 the failure of institutions, I think it really comes down to that trust. You know, we, 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 we want to be able to say to our, our public officials that they're doing a good job, but when you hear stories about like Walter Scott and someone saying, you know, hey, uh, he was a dangerous person and I had to sh shoot him because for his, you know, for my safety. And then you get the video evidence that comes out and completely contradicts that. That's a breakdown in trust. And so what I see the, the liberating element of technology is, is a, it's a, a check. It's a check on power to say that if, um, if you're going to make statements, we want to make sure they're true. We want to have transparency and accountability. Um, and like I said before, but with that comes responsibility. It's about how you use those tools. Um, I've seen an over-reliance in a lot of places, like drone technology will be flying over the streets of Baltimore, um, capturing what's going on down there and continually spying on people in a panopticon society. We don't want to have that either. So it's about balancing those two. But for me, it comes down to, it comes down to trust. And um, I think technology can be an incredible tool for that. And I'm really excited to see um, how it's advancing as we go forward.
So I actually want to dive into this a little bit more because I think that so often when we think about technology, we, we talk about the ways in which it can make a system more efficient, in which it can help, and, and you all mentioned, you know, stretch very finite resources to their farthest capacity. But ultimately, when we look at our criminal justice system, it's not simply sort of a numbers issue or a capacity issue. It's also a very human issue. Um, and when you think about problems like the dramatic overrepresentation of people of color in the system, right, it's also a fairness issue. And fully fulfilling that promise of equal justice under law that's on the Supreme Court of the United States. So I'd love to you know, talk a little bit more about about how technology and using tech to sort of hack the system can not only make this a more efficient system, but also make one that f sort of fully fulfills all of its promises. I think it's the underuse of data. I mean, we have so much potential for data and do data analytics to figure out what is working, what is not working, what are the stats of why are people going in, and it's it really is a black hole. And if we can allow for the, the data to be utilized, but there's a public policy side of that, which is privacy, right? So how do you anonymize the data to ensure that you're not exposing, you know, someone's criminal record to a bunch of researchers um, and ensuring that you have anonymous data with that can be utilized in an effective way? Um, you know, the whole issue is can it be, you know, once it's anonymized, can they t figure out from data points who that person is and things of that nature? And that's a general privacy debate we're having now within the country. Right. But for this, you know, we really need to create a set of data standards of the collection so we can do the analytics across counties and cities and states so we can figure out what are the best practices, what are the efficient ways of doing it. You know, what is helping, what is working. And if we can start focusing on that, we can at least get into how we should be spending our resources in a way that saves, you know, both the taxpayer money, but also allows more resources to be put into other programs such as, you know, rehabilitation centers or education. I was going to ask you, Derek, if you wanted to jump in on that. And I, have, and I have a little bit of a different perspective than Rick, not one that comes to a different conclusion, but I think that... And you know, I would say this 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 whole confab of, of South by Southwest is is a good example of this. I think there is a bit of a fetishization of data without necessarily clarifying what that data is. Um, you know, I can I can tell you on the research side when it comes to certain data sets, we can we we have uh, data sets uh, almost as granular as you would want. The problem is is those the data in those data sets are not perfect. For example. Let's just suppose that we had, you know, very granular sentencing data and offense data all for everyone that's ever been sentenced across the country. Well, the problem is what, it, what is a felony in Ohio is not necessarily the same as what's a felony in Texas. Even if the facts of the case were exactly the same, it might be charged under radically different, uh, rad rad radically different parts of the statute based on, uh, based on the prosecutor, based on... Uh, local law enforcement, and based on other sort of ephemeral political factors. So even when we have that data, it's more important to know about the contextualization of the data. It's how do we take that data and distill it down to something that's either A, undergirds a uh, basic principle, Jasmine, you mentioned uh, about fairness. Uh, but it's ba you need to make sure that data has some end to it, or some articulable end to it at least. Lauren, that sort of speaks very deeply to the work that you do and this challenge of not seeing data and tech as a panacea, but rather a road into understanding the other solutions that we need. Yeah, I mean, I think Derek brought up a good point. Um, you know, different offenses uh, vary in different states. They can be exactly the same circumstances. And he also brought up a good point about the role the prosecutors play in the criminal justice system. I think it's something that we don't talk enough about, just how much power prosecutors yield um, for basically anything and everything, um, and how we have basically no information on how any of these prosecutors operate. Um, you know, we, they're one of the single biggest actors in the criminal justice system, um, and yet we don't know anything about how they organize their offices, um, how they determine who to charge, what they'll charge them with. Um, and, you know, we, we just don't have basically any information of how, how they're making these determinations. And so I think it's important when we're, when we're looking at this issue um, to remember that a lot of these questions that need to be answered 
happen at the local level and they happen with one particular actor that doesn't have a whole lot of accountability or even any sort of, um, you know, there's no way for us to track how these determinations are being made. And so there are people, and, and it's also hard when you get someone in prison to look at their, um, the information that is, is on their sheet or whatever, uh, you know, it's just their convictions. It's not necessarily um, what they were charged with. You know, in our, in our society where plea bargaining is so commonplace, um, there are people who might have pled guilty to something um, to get a shorter sentence or to be charged with something else. Um, they might have had charges dropped. And so this, this and I, I don't mean to, I'm just kind of challenging the narratives of, of sometimes what we use in the, in the conservative criminal justice reform movement or libertarians, we, always, we often talk about the low level nonviolent drug offender. Um, we don't know how often you know, people are charged with other things that were later dropped. And also with people who are convicted of violent offenses, violent. We don't know the circumstances sometimes of, of these of offenses. Um, and, we, and we don't know, you know what made a prosecutor charge them with whatever they were charged with. Um, so that's another thing. I'm being pretty pessimistic, I'm sorry. I'm just like, like this in life. Um, and I'm <laughs> serving that role on the panel. But I mean, I just can't emphasize enough how, how little information we have about these you know, important things that are happening with the criminal justice system. And how without, even with tech, it's hard to really make our system efficient if we, don't, if we know so little. And I, I want to go back to that because I'm hearing some rumblings in the audience that point resonating to you, particularly this idea that there can sometimes be an almost spurious distinction between violence and nonviolence. And we tend to see those as sort of very hard categories. But when you're actually trying to take an expansive look at the system, that's maybe unnecessarily reductive. Derek, I see you nodding and thinking. And John, I saw a lot of head nodding. Do you want to weigh in on that? Um, well, I, I want to roll back a little bit to your first point, because I want to stress, and perhaps to be less pessimistic, to offer an optimistic <laughs> thing here. Perfect. There is Thank so you. much uh, low-hanging fruit um, for the opportunities that um, technology brings to the criminal justice space. So the humdrum examples that I have in mind are bringing uh, your day-to-day -day legal services online. So we all expect that we do our taxes online, right? Like, I doubt that there's very many of us who have the need to not do our taxes with uh, an online service that make that speeds up the process, that gives you access to the information that you need immediately, mm. that you can do on your own time. Uh, and we should demand uh, that our legal services everywhere else are brought online uh, as well. So you can imagine the difference between going in and finding time in your day to go to a brick and mortar office um, where you need to bring your documents and, and you meet with an attorney and you file uh, for some kind of legal process or service, right? Um, versus being able to pull up uh, a site on your phone or sit down at your desktop computer at home and gather the information you need right there. Start it, maybe stop, start again, when you have time. Right, the difference, we're all familiar with just how effective uh, an online process can be for very basic um, humdrum tasks. And it's, it's sort of um, uh, an obvious win. I, I, I've been doing this, this work for a couple of years now and I've never seen a downside so it's only a matter of time, and we should demand that it, it happens sooner rather than later for the legal processes that are uh, necessary in our, our everyday lives. Thank you for a uh, array of sunshine, <laughs> even as it's quite cloudy outside. Um, do you want to dive into this violence, nonviolence question? Uh, yeah, so. Um, and I see Derek's poised to go as soon ahead, as you're done. Um, so we've talked a little bit about um, the problems with this violence, nonviolence distinction. And um, I do think that this is mostly a legislative mm. um, issue. So it's, it's not necessarily something that uh, I see technology addressing directly. I mean, we can collect more data and that can help, right? So you can imagine with uh, an online process like, like what I was just saying, we have an opportunity to collect a data point there that we didn't have otherwise, right? So when someone files for a process online, we can, um, you know, basically say, here, this person filed at this time, and we can anonymize the data so that we have responsible use of that. But that's an opportunity right there to have a data point that we didn't have before. And the goal there would be to collect data to drive policy. So the, the data that we would care about in this case is data about who is being um, booked or charged under which statute, right? And that would help us um, get more information about, well, here's the problem that this particular statute has in this particular state. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, you know, if um, I'm just pulling numbers out of thin air here, but if you know, 50,000 people uh, were charged under um, a statute over the course of five years uh, that categorized a certain offense as violent, right? 
we could, now we have something to work with. We can say, uh, this is causing you know, inestimable, inestimable amount of harm in the state. Uh, it's causing us resources, it's costing us resources. Uh, we need to reform the statute, right? Mm -hmm. So that's concrete uh, evidence we can use, data we can use to drive policy and reform. And, and look, there, I, have to, I have to agree with both, with both Rick and John here. There's nobody I'd like to see more out of work than lawyers. Um, <laughs> But I, but I, I think to, the, the, to John's point, though, is that technology offers an opportunity for disruption, but one that is going to be resisted tooth and nail. I mean, just look, uh, what do we got going on in Texas right now? Uh, issues of telemedicine and the prescriptive authority of advanced practice nurses. It seems like a rather innocuous policy discussion that can really democratize access to this. But, you know, there are latent interests here that will fight tooth and nail to keep the, to keep the status quo. On the issue of, of violent offenders, I, I again, I, I have to take a little bit different of an approach, and it's not that I disagree, it's just that I think that the way the law is constructed is that violence and non -vi or a violent and a nonviolent offense, you know, there are some that are clear delineations, you know, personal possession of drugs, aggravated assault. You can delineate those, but if you start looking through some of the, especially the low-level offenses that we have here in Texas, you see oh, here is a, a possession with intent to distribute and assault, right? And I, I use those uh, specifically. Possession with intent to distribute could be, well, that person had a gun on them as well, and that could be a satisfying element of that. Assault <coughs> means you yelled at somebody. Right. And you see, but if you were to delineate between the two, you know, just kind of in the, you know, superficially, you would say, oh, well, the drug possession is nonviolent and the, uh, the um, assault is a violent offense. And so we have a problem of, uh, this illustrates a grander problem, I should say, of, of really poorly prescribed law. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, laws are not written very well. <laughs> Special, and, I, and, I, and I'm not saying that to, to denigrate those that write them, but they're usually, you know, you know, birthed into being by a fresh out of college staffer, either up the road or, uh, or in DC. And they don't, they don't think about uh, elements like, to Jordan's point, mens rea. They don't think of elements such as, um, you know, well, is there really a veneer of violence on this? Mm -hmm. and, and it's not that they, you know, have malice in their heart to do this. It's, we're, you know, we here have, you know, just a 140-day session, and we're over halfway through that already, and we haven't passed a single law. Right. And so it, it really becomes an issue of the legislative process. And this is also why in Texas we've started taking more of an approach uh, where we have these commissions. We had an overcriminalization commission that met this last, this last legislative session in which they identified hundreds of laws that are vestigial or, or duplicates or just didn't make any sense. And so now legislators have this report and then go, well, this is stupid, this is stupid, this is stupid. And that's why we see legislation like, you know, the resale of a gold watch without a certificate was like a, I, I think like a state jail felony. Now, I don't think many people were prosecuted under it, but right. this kind of, just having it on the books, you know, is like leaving around a loaded gun. So before we sort of turn it to the audience for questions, I wanna go back and pull on a slightly different strand, um, which we've had several sort of shout outs or references to anonymizing data and this tension, I think, between using technology to engender transparency, but also not wanting to further increase the sort of footprint of the justice system and also take concerns about right to privacy very, very seriously. Um, Jordan, I'd love to hear from you on this because I know you You've done some very careful thinking, both about the great promise of transparency, but also Fourth Amendment protections. Yeah, so I think one of the, the best examples of this is if a police officer is called to someone's house because there's an emergency going on there, and he flips on his body-worn camera as he's walking indoors, he's able to record everything that happens inside that home, um, whether or not that person wants it there or not, to have their entire home recorded. So. There, there are cases of police officers who walk into to the dwelling places and you know, they'll go past your living room, they'll get pictures of your children <laughs> on the, the nightstand. Um, this, and this is uh, potentially all for public disclosure once uh, that video is released in court or um, if it's released through a subpoena for the, for the public to see. Um, and I think there's, there's a real balance we have to have about we wanna have accountability but also privacy for citizens. Um, the Constitution Project released um, a really good report a while ago that talks about some of the balances we should be having when it comes to this. Uh, they've got a lot of good recommendations in there, but one of them is um, 
you know, how, how we interact with citizens because a lot of times people don't even know they're being recorded. And that can happen in their home, it could happen on the street. There's even some cases of where officers would put cameras um, right across six blocks away from someone's house on a pole and just keep it there for six weeks to record everything that happened in their front yard as they go about their day. You know, their argument was, hey, it's in plain view of their house and I, you know, anyone else can see it. Um, but that, that goes back to the, the, the idea of we're continually being watched and recorded. And the problem happens once, um, things we don't even think about. An officer could be completely um, trying to do his best to show respect someone's privacy, but when that camera's rolling, um, it's picking up um, people at their worst situations, um, people who have um, had a family member die in their home, and that's now recorded for everyone to see in court. Um, so I think there's, there's the balance we have to have, and I think um, a lot of um, police stations and officers are doing good jobs crafting guidelines that address those concerns. So when so generally in the cases, if someone says, can you turn that recording off, they'll, they'll um, respect that request. Um, but I don't want to be too, too, uh, too pessimistic. I think it's, uh, I think it's a great, there, there's, there's a great uh, use of this. And one, I one area of that is, you know, police officers can record, but so can citizens. And I think uh, that's a really powerful tool because ev almost everyone has a cell phone that has video and camera. Um, you know, I'm not going to encourage everyone to whip out a cell phone every time they're in a law enforcement situation. But, you know, we've gotten incredible stories and we've gotten um, different perspectives on situations when someone was in a, in a heated situation, they whipped out their cell phone, and now we have another side to the story. So I think it's a balancing tool for both sides, but it has to be done with respect, um, both by the citizens and by the police. And, and Rick, you know, there has been a lot of, um, there's been a strong narrative around this idea that policing the police is something that undermines trust and creates rifts, but you actually see this kind of transparency both ways as something that can build trust, and you talked about that earlier. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're in a world now of Facebook and perception becoming reality, fake <laughs> news, all those issues that you hear about. Um, and I think having the ability to gather more data, have the ability of, of cameras and others to really begin with the trust, because as was pointed out earlier, there is a breakdown of trust between law enforcement and, and some of the and, and citizens. And you have a lot of good people in law enforcement trying to do the right thing, risking their lives every day. And that's sometimes overlooked because of an incident that is horrible and occurs. And so making sure that we can build that trust, you know, getting back to you know, the relationships of, of the past is going to be hard. I mean, there's a lot of bridges that have been burned right now. And, but taking and using technologies to help build that trust and just human interaction, which is key to all this, um, so it's not just technology, but other steps in conjunction with technology, I think can help bring that back. Because we do need, you know, officers on the streets. I talked to one police officer, you know, who said that they're having a real hard time recruiting now to get police officers because of the stigma of being an officer. And yet, you know, there are so many good officers. Yeah, there's, a, there's bad people in every profession. You have bad politicians, you have bad doctors, bad lawyers, and bad police people. It's, it's just the way society is. But you can't let that become the perception. And I think having the use of technologies, body cameras, and others, um, data points to show that no, 99% of the time it's good. You know, that's always the goal. And, but the 1% is not dictating everything else that we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before we before we give the the panel their sort of chance at final words, and before we delve deeper into the gloom and doom panel of the morning, um, I want to open it up to the audience and potential questions that may be out there. And also, I don't know if we have this technology. If you're on Facebook Live, maybe, or some other remote viewing, if you want to send us questions, you can tweet them at me. I have my phone in front of me, um, or you know, folks in the room. Um, if you look for Jasmine Heist, you'll find me. Yes? Well, my question is for Lauren. You, you, you talked about um, some issues that I'm very passionate about. I'm a former prosecutor and, and talk about prosecutors reform within the prosecutor's office. What idea specifically do you have of actually creating an environment of more accountability that doesn't actually violate some of the separation of power issues that we have between the executive branch um, and legislators? And if but for the life of me, I never understand why we spend so much time talking about police reform and so little time talking about prosecutor reform because 
with all these like you know my my kids are, are, are men and women of blue. After they know for too long in in, in your book, they just, they don't have that much say in what happens. In fact, they have almost no say in what happens. So, what ideas do you have specifically to to make us feel more warm, warm and fuzzy about <laughs> making sure possible work happens? Yeah. Um, so. I don't really know. Um, <laughs> I think it starts with being able to sort of track information about, or just from a researcher's perspective, it would be really nice to have some sort of data set of charging decisions or you know, original charges that were later dropped, just so we sort of have something that we can measure because I think there's how many counties in the US? 3,144 or something like that. And <laughs> <All right. laughs> something like that, give or take. Uh, <laughs> And you know, those are a lot. Those are a lot of decisions being made um, in different offices, and just the way that they're structured, we don't really know anything. Um, and you know, back to the sort of issue of violence versus nonviolence. I think I wanted to add one small point: is that it would be really nice to be able to see. Um, you know, as I was going through all of the inmates who are incarcerated for the pill offenses, I kept seeing um, resisting of an officer with violence. Um, you know whether or not that's just like, hey, or we've all seen the videos of stop resisting, stop resisting, and it's like people on the ground, they're not necessarily resisting, whatever. Sometimes they are. It would be really nice if we could see, you know, how often those charges are tacked on by county. So we can see, is there a certain prosecutor who is consistently charging people with these types of offenses? Um, and, you know, being able to kind of question where those determinations are being made. Is there a particular prosecutor that's a problem? Um, you know, just having that information, I think, as a researcher, that would be really useful in order to figure out how can we make prosecutors more accountable or how can we make them less punitive or something like that. Um, so it's not really a good answer to your question because I'm not really sure. But another way that I think that we've seen a positive step forward in certain counties is that, um, you know, there's been sort of a grassroots movement against these really tough, tough prosecutors at certain counties. Um, like. Angela Corey in Duval County in Florida. Um, they had one of the highest, um, they sent the most people to death row, I think, in the state. Um, she was consistently sending children to prison as adults. And I think that once the public got wind of how she was charging people and how punitive she was being, um, when she was up for election, we put a reformer in her, in her well, it's to be TBD, I guess. We'll, we'll wait and see what happens. Um, same thing happened in Harris County. Um, you know, they replaced that punitive DA. It's just because the public had more information about how these DAs were operating. And I think just having that and being able to hold them accountable would just make our justice system better. But I really don't have a better option or a better answer besides that. Derek's ready to go to offer yeah. one. Well, I, I, I think the, the, the central thrust to, to answer Arthur's question is you, you, need a, you need a cultural shift. You know, it's the, the, this is one of the, the sad, uh, I, I would say, one of the sad outcomes uh, of having a, a uh, adversarial justice system. Now, don't get me wrong, an adversarial justice system uh, such as is mitigated, or such as used in the United States is far superior to, say, an inquisitorial one that, you know, that we don't see in many Western democracies. The bigger issue with that, though, is that it, ingrained, you know, if you're on that side, if you're on that team, if you're on that side of the ball, your goal, again, you know, we talk about the, uh, the Robert Jackson quote, you know, the idea is to do justice, but l let's be real, on that particular team, your, your goal is to win. And, you know, it's the defense's job to make sure that they, you know, defend their client, and of course there's an issue of, uh, of uh, disparate resources on that as well. However, I, 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 to, to uh, Lauren's point, it, it, is a, it is a cultural shift that is starting. Now, I, don't, I wouldn't have said that the previous uh, Harris County DA was, was punitive. The, the program that uh, Harris County is now known for, they're not prosecuting for low-level drug offenses right now. They're doing a full prosecutor-led diversion program. That actually started under the previous DA. Um, but you generally see the, the kind of you know, the atavistic, tough on crime, thump your chest approach, that doesn't get you anything anymore politically. I mean, just take a look nationally. You know, I, you know we, we're a 501c3 here, but I can look back historically and uh, assess the campaign of uh, Begich in Alaska. He, he threw out a tough on crime uh, 
uh, attack right as his uh, campaign was going down in flames. And you know, also the gubernatorial race of Louisiana, that was another one that kind of went back to that area. And to where even the sheriffs were like, nah, that's not how we do business anymore. The sheriffs came out and said that. So we start seeing a shift on the political landscape here. And so I think that cultural shift that's, go that's gonna necessitate you know, this being a more broad uh, sweeping change is already begun. And um, yeah, go oh, ahead. I was just gonna say, I think part also is that you know, prosecutors have basically unlimited resources. Right. Um, and you know, I, I was a lobbyist you know, for Fox. You know, my biggest fear was somehow somebody has the, you know, says Rick Lane, you know, Rupert Murdoch's new Fox News lobbyist. You know, I'm done at that point, right? I mean, you know, it, because I'm already guilty. And then you have prosecutors, you know, you see at the federal level, like what happened to Senator Ted Stevens or Governor McConnell or McDonald. Um, you know, overturned by the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. you know, you have folks, their goal is to win. And, you know, it's no different than, you know, the head coach of, you know, University of Texas, right? You know, if you're not winning, you're fired. And so, you, you know, five and five record or five and six record at Texas, you know, isn't going to get you anywhere. And if you're in a prosecutor's position, it's the same thing. You know, you're going for to be undefeated. And so you're going to use, and, and in their mind, I don't think they're doing it because they're evil. I think in their mind, they've convinced themselves that the person is guilty. Mm -hmm. And so they want to use the resources. They want to use, utilize every aspect of the law to go after, and they get competitive. They, you know, they want that win. And so something needs to be in place to help tilt that back, you know, what is the scorecard? You know, I think we need to change the scorecard of prosecutors. You know, how many people that were committed a crime were able to get out and, you know, recidivism, you know, sort of like graduation rates for football coaches, right? You know, stop focusing just on the wins. How many kids are actually graduating from your teams and have that as part of your score? So maybe looking at that part of what the incentives are for prosecutors. The other last thing on prosecutors, especially at the local level, is they're elected. And most people have no idea who their prosecutors are, their right. DA. I mean, I, you know, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland, and it's the same person who runs. Every time you're like, hey, I know that name, I don't know what they do, but sure, that sounds great. Doug Gansler was you know, a good friend of mine, um, is a good friend of mine, and you know, he started at Montgomery County and worked his way up to the AG. But they have, you know, it's, when they're running, they're running on wins, and, that's, and it's tough, it's tough. And in the in the coalition for public safety spirit of, of bipartisanship, I just want to give a shout out to um, the ACLU. We have Bill Cobb sitting over to my right here, who's also doing some really careful thinking about how you look at the office of the prosecutor and the role of the prosecutor and sort of shift the justice system based on that. Um, I see another question, and you're ready to go. So come on up. not forget that a lot of the pressure against the GDP is because, is because a lot of offices uh, in the US and Europe will never stop the cash. And they need to make choices, sometimes tough choices, where do we spend our money? So I was wondering whether any thinking has gone to this very particular issue, and also just as a question of curiosity, who would decide, is this something that the federal government, could the federal government say to everybody, you need to have this kind of data collection, is this something back to the states, or to the counties, or so it's for these more aspects. I'll, I'll jump in on that on the on, on the cost estimate on the cost estimate. No, they, they simply put, they have not yet. Um, the various reforms that we've advocated for here in Texas, I, you know, before a bill is able to be uh, laid out in a legislative committee, it has to be attended by a fiscal note. Now, there's also there's structural problems with how those fiscal notes are are created. They simply have, um, you know, they don't have the capacity to go and actually. Uh, vet out the actual infrastructure of, say, Hudspeth County, which is like one county to the, the east of uh, El Paso. What they do is they call the Hudspeth County clerk, and uh, he or she will tell them, uh, yeah, that system, that'll probably cost us about one and a half million dollars. You know, there's no verification on that. And some of times they probably underestimate, and many times they overestimate. 
the the bigger problem is is kicking that up to the state or you know even to the federal government you're starting to get into an idea of centralizing you know the whole data collecting apparatus which in the american experience is something that you know is per se uh, viewed with skepticism um, especially if the if it came with a federal mandate without any dollars attached Conversely, on the conservative side, now we also have the issue of, well, if we attach dollars to that, now we get into this idea of cooperative federalism, and I can just speak for the, you know, the legislators here in uh, the state of Texas, you know, the, they see the strings on those federal dollars, and they tend to, they tend to have a, a visceral reaction against that. So I think that there's a, uh, the best approach there is a best practice argument. Um, show, uh, as we've done in, in many cases, show how when you have this data, it can be used you know, for X, Y, and Z, which, incre which increases efficiency, it increases uh, workflow, it makes their job easier, and that in and of itself should be a reason why they should consider gathering it. And I'm gonna, we're, we're running low on time, but I see Bill Cobb at the mic ready to ask his question, so I'm gonna use my moderator's privilege and extend us just a little longer. Sorry, Nathan. <laughs> Thank you, sir, I really appreciate that. Um, so my question is, is there a way to utilize data accurately portray the culture of prosecution and the culture of policing. Because it's not a matter of whether or not they're good cops or bad cops. Um, whether or not somebody is convicted of a violent offense has to do with the culture of the district attorney's office and has to do with the culture of policing, which has led to a disproportionate number of black and brown people being incarcerated in our system. So how can we use data to actually capture that because that is the most significant driver of mass incarceration. Yeah, I think that um, that's a good question. And um, another data point that we, we actually have no information on are like police involved shootings. We don't keep track of when those are occurring, what caused those things to happen. I mean, we have a little bit, but from sort of like across a national, we, we don't have any sort of data that explains when these things happen and why. Um, similar with prosecutors. Um, and you're right, I mean, I think that the shift does need to come culturally, uh, but how do, we, how do we use that? I think just having some more information about how these charging decisions are being made, how the offices are structured, and what they're doing with their power um, would sort of shine a light on who the bad apples are, but how we collect that and where we get that from and how that would, what that would look like, I'm not really sure because we just have nothing right now. You know, we have cer certain instances where there are like really bad district attorneys who they go on the radio and they talk against the victims who they're supposed to be representing. <laughs> like, you know, well, I'm pushing for the death penalty even though the victim doesn't want it. Or, you know, uh, I'm gonna be doing this even though whatever. Like, they kind of start to come out on their own. But there are so many different offices. Like, there are thousands. There, there are hundreds of thousands of prosecutors. And f figuring out a way to sort of track these decisions and, and see how we can weed out those bad apples in a more efficient way, I'm not sure what that would look like, but I hope that we can come up with something. <laughs> I, I'm just not the person to do that, but I think that would be really useful. John, do you wanna add to that? I see a lot of head nodding about this idea of shifting culture. Um, I think one of the things that um, we can draw from like this incredible discussion uh, is uh, we increasingly need to think about data-driven policy reform. And what would that look like? And I think uh, a sketch or a picture of what that might look like that we're getting is something like uh, as follows, right? Uh, a citizenry demands of its government that it retain uh, data pertaining to, let's say, a particular statute, right? So um, we demand that the courts, right? Because that's where it starts. That's where the information begins. It's the only place where we're going to get the data that we need. The courts have to retain information about who was charged under what statute for a given time period, right? Once we have that requirement in place, we can evaluate, we can actually scrutinize a policy or a statute, right? And if we decide to overturn it um, for reasons uh, relating to its ineffectiveness or its cost, um, we can do so. But uh, outside of that, we really just, we have no uh, information. We only have um, gesticulations by politicians, maybe tough on crime fears um, to go on, right? So um, I think that is something that, that is really useful as we do uh, increasingly have better awareness of the power of data uh, online, uh, in, even in our own shopping or day-to-day -day lives, we understand the power of creating uh, data profiles pertaining to individuals to evaluate the effectiveness of a, of a process or a system. And that's something that we should increasingly demand from um, our local governments. And, you know, it's not something that um, 
the optics are sort of boring, right? You can, it's hard to picture people standing outside of a building with a sign that says, we want re you know, data retention now, <laughs> right? Like, uh, but it is, it is going to be the deciding factor in getting um, the reform that we're looking for. And can I just add, yeah, please. I think it's important to understand the appropriations process and the dollars. And, and I think, unfortunately, the criminal justice, reform, criminal justice system is siloed in how things are funded. So you have the prosecutors funding, you have the judges funding, and then you have the, pr the prison and jail funding, right? And law enforcement funding. And they're all kind of in these different categories. So if I'm a prosecutor, I don't care how many people I prosecute. If I'm a judge, you know, I don't care how many people I send to prison. It's not my budget. You know, that's the, you know, someone else's budget, even though it's a more macro kind of county and city budget or state budget. And so maybe tying the budgets together in one macro way where if I'm sending somebody to prison, that's going to not allow me to increase the salaries of the prosecutors. You know, you know that ha may have an impact, right? Because it's, it's all of a sudden, it's like, what's the cost-benefit ratio to me and my division and my area versus, hey, I'm going to get my 10% increase no matter what because I'm separate. And then the j you know, people dealing with the prisons and the jails, you know, they have to deal with their own problems and overcrowding. You know, that's not my issue. And maybe you just kind of tie those together because money does sometimes have an interesting impact. So with that, I think we have to wrap or I'm going to get tackled off the stage for letting this panel run quite long. But thank you so much to our brilliant and wonderful panelists. Um, and I would just say, you know, there are so many very smart people in this room right now, so please find each other right now in, I believe, this small break time. Talk to each other, and let's all begin to solve some of these problems. Thank you so much. <laughs>